Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to tonight's uh, live review for AP Euro. Just a couple more nights before the exam, so great to be hanging out with y'all. And we're going to see if people are here and all of that kind of stuff. Let me go ahead and let Twitter know that we're here. All right, we're going to let Twitter know that we're here and all of that good stuff. All right, so let's see. Uh, now, remember, questions are going to come from Twitter. That's going to be the primary way for y'all to communicate with me here, okay? And so if you're not watching from tomritchie.net slash euro, um, you might not be seeing a few of the things that I've got uh, set up for you. Now, let me make sure that everything is how it's supposed to be here. All right. So it looks like our hangout is going and we'll have some questions from Twitter pretty soon. Looks like we've already got about 375 here. So thank y'all. A lot of people giving this some likes. Awesome. Give it some likes. Uh, that kind of, you know, helps it trend and all of that kind of stuff. And so ladies and gentlemen, I'll be checking Twitter at Tom Ritchie for questions very, very shortly. It looks like everything that is supposed to be working is is working. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. And a shout out to begin with to my friends at Mount Juliet High School outside of Nashville, Tennessee. They gave me this t-shirt. I did a review. They made a t-shirt for the review with my name on it. Isn't that kind of cool there? Uh, actually, it's really cool. I'm very pleased with those, uh, those folks. Very glad to have met them. All right. And so as far as that, yes, thank you, Mr. Cox's class and Cade and uh, Noah and all the other great uh, people. All right, that we're over there. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to be broadcasting tonight and then tomorrow evening at seven. Now, remember at nine o'clock a.m. Eastern on Friday, there's going to be the annual breakfast with Richie broadcast. Now, remember, I've got the Romulus app that I have discounted. My partners have agreed to discount this from $2.99 to $0.99. Cents. Now, as soon as this broadcast is over, it's going back up to $2.99. So if you want to get the Romulus Euro app, a handy little trivia review for you, it is on iOS and Android. So you can get that for $0.99 cents until the conclusion of this broadcast. Okay, so remember that. And also, so uh, I've still got some spots left here, only 30 spots total and about 15 spots left for the salon review, which will go from 8.30 to 10.30 this evening. The multiple choice strategy session from last night, uh, if you use Euro MC30, if you want to look at that, you can get 30% off the archive there. And then for those of you looking for writing tips, my eight month writing clinic, I am discounting that $10. You can use eight clinic 10 at checkout. Um, Typically, writing questions, I've got the free videos for the AP Euro, DBQ, and LEQ. And if you want to go deeper than that, you actually want to see me um, get that, you know, to set it up and all of that kind of stuff and go really deep into it and critique some essays, the eight-month writing clinic's the way to go. You can get $10 off using 8 Clinic 10. Okay, so the app's there. We're going to have the salon review later. Everything's going to be awesome. So let's go ahead and get to what we're doing here, ladies and gentlemen. And let's see. So we're going to go ahead and get over to uh, Twitter in just a bit and see what the what the questions are looking like. Uh, but first, let me just there's one thing that I need to correct here. All right. Now, remember that as far as priority goes, ladies and gentlemen, uh, as far as priority, it's going to be people who are following me, who at mention me and also use the hashtag Dragon Energy. Uh, you know, somebody from uh, from Pensbury just uh, just made me the coolest uh, little thing here. Thank you, Leah. Like if you're wondering where my profile picture comes from, that is Leah from Pensbury High School um, in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. And so glad to have uh, to have met those folks over the weekend. And so let me just run, let me fix a quick link here and I will be with y'all shortly and we will get to the Q&A. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, remember that salon review, last time I checked, there were 16 out of 30 spots remaining for that review. So you wanna make sure that you're uh, able to get on that one to make sure that all of the links were working there. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, so everything's working like it should. Good deal, good deal. All right, well, let's see what our questions. Now remember, hashtag Dragon Energy. Okay, you're looking for that Dragon Energy hashtag. Um, those are gonna get priority. All right, let's see what we've got here. All right. So as far as uh, as far as this goes, uh, Jen. Okay, let's go ahead and take a look at 
uh, you know, at European integration. OK, so we're getting into the post-war era. All right. So European integration is basically now one of the themes of the AP European history course is national and European identity. And so one thing that we see, uh, you know, at the very beginning of the course is that Europe was very feudal, uh, given that it was local government. You didn't really have I mean, you had France, you had England, you had Scotland, but you wouldn't really call them nations based on the modern definition. So one of the things we see in, you know, with the French Revolution and with uh, the 19th century, we see the emergence of nationalism. Now, of course, nationalism brings some people together, but it also tears some people apart and it can get, uh, you know, that sort of thing can get really ugly sometimes. And so after, uh, you know, killing each other in two world wars, um, the Europeans started thinking about, you know, how is it that we can integrate? And what you're looking at is beginning as an economic union. OK, so you've got, uh, you know, the. European Economic Community, EEC, the, uh, you know, the European Coal and Steel Community. So after, you know, as far as this goes, and it started with like, you know, France and Germany and the Benelux countries, uh, Belgium, the Netherlands and Luxem Luxembourg. Um, and then eventually Britain came in, but France didn't initially want them in. Now we, of course, see Britain kind of making its way out, easing its way out of the European Union. But the European Union is really kind of the culmination of European integration. And what you've got with the European Union is not just an economic union or a free trade zone, kind of like what we have in North America. You know, in North America, we have a free trade zone uh, between the United States, Mexico, and Canada. But they've also got a political union, and that coincides with the fall of the Soviet Union. So the, uh, the Treaty of Maastricht, OK, if I'm trying to use my Dutch, I'm going to be going back to the Netherlands next month. So Maastricht um, the, or the Maastricht Treaty, that's what starts this process of European integration. Now, of course, what we've seen in very recent years is there seems to be some pushback uh, in some of these countries against the increasing integration. Now, I don't see nations on the continent leaving the European Union the way that we've seen with Brexit. But at the same time, there are some challenges, you know, as far as maybe the European Union's gotten too powerful and we see the reemergence of nationalism. So this whole idea of national and European identity is very important. If anybody's watching from Mr. Baker's class in Blacksburg, he, you know, once said that he is Scottish and British and European and American, and he doesn't see any conflict in those identities. Uh, I have had him on my summer broadcast the last couple of years. Might have to do that again. So if Mr. Baker's students are watching, um, you know, thank you so much. But European integration is this process of economic and political cooperation, uh, you know, that began after World War II with the European Economic Community and, of course, has culminated with the European Union. And uh, as far as that goes, ladies and gentlemen, let me just see what we've got here. Um, you know, sometimes I give a shout out to new Instagram followers. Looks like Sophie Jackson just followed me. Uh, we've got uh, Maya Olson has just given me a follow. Uh, thank you so much. And um, Johanna. OK, very good. Very good. Thank you all for the follows at Tom Ritchie on Instagram, just like with Twitter. And I'm going to be posting some dank European history memes. I've got one that I'm sitting on right now that I'm so excited about. Actually, you know what I'm going to do here? I'm going to go ahead and post my new uh, Bismarck meme here. I've um, got to thank actual student uh, Ethan uh, for, for giving me the idea here and the comment. So I'm just going to go ahead and uh, get this uh, get this going here. So I'm going to post my latest meme on Instagram at Tom Ritchie. Thank you, sweetheart. Yeah. Um, you know, my wife just brought me a uh, mug of tea. Do what you love. Uh, and I love teaching European history. So here we go. Uh, this also comes from my friends at Mount Juliet High School. And uh, thank you very much, Mr. Cox, for your hospitality. So let me go ahead. I'm on Instagram at Tom Ritchie and I'm posting a new uh, meme. So, uh, you know, AP Euro hashtag. And if you got friends, get them in here. OK, so AP Euro hashtag meme. All right. So let's go ahead and make sure that we have a warm welcome here um, for this new Bismarck meme. All right. So I want to see all these new people coming in here and giving that a uh, giving that a like if you feel so inclined. All right. So as far as that, uh, far as that goes, 
we are going to get that going. All right. So ladies and gentlemen, thank y'all very much. Uh, go ahead and to see my new meme on Instagram. So let's go ahead and take another question. All right. We got some more notifications here. All right. Uh, let's see. We've got, uh, you know, let's see. So um, Kayla, let's go ahead and take a quick. Now, remember, hashtag dragon energy. All right. So we're going to go ahead and give Kayla a quick answer. Just ask her about Versailles. Um, Kayla, I would be tempted here. Um, if you will, uh, you know, if you want to tell us about uh, Versailles, I would love to get you in on this thing, uh, you know, to uh, to actually talk to us about it. Um, so if you'd like to talk to us about Versailles, Kayla, send me a DM on Twitter and let's uh, let's get you on here. All right. All right. So Lenin's NEP, Lenin's NEP was the new economic policy. All right. And so what the new economic policy is, it's an, an answer to what at first they called war communism. OK, so when Lenin first took over with the Bolshevik Revolution, um, the first thing he did was this war communism where we're going to try to apply communism, you know, basically philosophically, we're going to get rid of private property. We're going to abolish not only like, you know, we're not going to have public ownership only of heavy heavy industry, but also public ownership of even small enterprises and stuff like that. Okay. So that's what we're looking at. Uh, looking at there is, you know, at first war communism. Now the thing is when, you know, there's a reason why, you know, nobody really uses pure communism because it doesn't work. Um, it doesn't have incentives and stuff like that. And so basically the NEP is allowing like, little bits of cap capitalism. Okay. So we're going to kind of lay off a little bit and we're going to let basic people have basically small businesses. All right. And, you know, so little capitalist ventures, like what I'm doing is probably, you know, not really on Lenin's radar, you know, that I've got a premium hangout happening, you know, premium session here um, that we're going to be having our salon later, you know, Lenin probably doesn't care about that. Okay. It's not like, you know, Tom Ritchie is operating heavy industry. That's the NEP. Now, now, Stalin, when he takes over, he moves away from the, uh, you know, from the NEP. Now, Stalin's five year plans are really based on increasing, uh, you know, industrial production. And at first, they're actually very successful at a time when, you know, the Western countries are dealing with the Great Depression. Now, the thing is that, you know, Russia was so far behind everything that it's like, OK, a planned economy is going to work to an extent until it stops. OK, because the difference between, you know, Stalin's economy and a market economy. OK, what we have to understand here and appreciate is a market economy. When you think about Adam Smith. Y'all see my hands? Now you don't. The invisible hand, right? So Adam Smith, you know, the whole idea of the invisible hand, you don't need the visible hand of like, you know, planned economies. You know, mercantilism uh, has a lot of elements of a planned economy because it's saying that we don't want to import. Uh, we don't want to import. We just want to export. Well, if everybody's just trying to export, you're not going to, uh, you're not really going to be able to get anywhere. But planned economies, you know, they're based on a lot of times, you know, production rather than consumption. Okay. Market economies are consumer driven, whereas, you know, planned economies are production driven. So when Stalin has his five-year plans, it's basically about what's going to be produced without any kind of, uh, you know, without any kind of regard for, uh, you know, what's, uh, you know, what the consumers want or anything like that. All right. And thank you so much, uh, Zara Valerie, for uh, for giving me the follow there on Instagram. And let's see if our uh, if our new meme is getting a little bit of love there. OK, y'all are showing that meme a little bit of love. Excellent. Thank you all so much. Uh, you know, there's no better satisfaction than, uh, you know, than having a uh, dank meme and people think that it's awesome. Okay. So thank y'all for that. All right. So as far as that goes, but yes, remember the five-year plans are, you know, abandoning the NEP. All right. So uh, the Enlightenment, Bob Smith, that would take us a long time to go over the Enlightenment. If you've got a more specific question, uh, then that would definitely help here. OK, so uh, let's see what we've got here. Uh, Snay hoot. All right. So uh, let's go ahead and get into that AP Euro hashtag Dragon Energy. Thank you all so much. All right. So as far as that goes, can you talk about enlightened despotism? Now, luckily for you, I have a video on enlightened despotism, enlightened absolutism. And, you know, what you need to know really is that there are three monarchs that you're going to be focusing on. OK, so enlightened despotism or enlightened absolutism. Um, what this is, what this is about is the 
uh, basically these absolute monarchs trying to apply the principles of the Enlightenment to their states, okay? So they would either look at, uh, you know, toleration of religious minorities. I have an acronym, TRAP, okay? So toleration of religious minorities, reform of institutions, of course, absolutism. Never forget that, that when we see that, you know, Catherine the Great's rule was challenged by Pugachev's rebellion, uh, you know, all of a sudden they went in a very enlightened response. It was a very repressive response there. Um, and so then finally, patronage of the philosophes. So toleration, reform, absolutism, and patronage. Uh, patronage. So Frederick the Great, Catherine the Great and Joseph the Second, the not so great, they're all in the trap together. Okay, so you've got these three monarchs in the trap, uh, which they are in various, uh, you know, various forms of this trap. Okay, so as far as Frederick the Great, okay, so Frederick the Great was seen as the most successful, that he tolerated uh, religious minorities, he reformed institutions and began a civil service system in Prussia. Uh, you know, he also introduced the potato as something that, hey, we got a lot of calories here and it's very easy to farm and it goes a long way. So they're, you know, they're doing this sort of thing. Um, and then, uh, you know, Frederick, of course, uh, was a patron of Voltaire. Now that was kind of a rocky relationship that sort of fell apart later. But at the same time, Frederick, uh, you know, for a while, he and Voltaire were BFFs. Voltaire lived there for the better part of three years. Now, Catherine the Great was really, you know, she owed a lot to the nobility for her throne. And so she couldn't really do much to reform institutions or anything like that. Um, and so what she did, what she made up for that by patronizing the philosophes. So for example, Diderot, the co-editor of the encyclopedia, uh, Diderot, when he was, uh, you know, hard up for cash, Catherine the Great heard about this and she purchased his library from him and, you know, then uh, said, hey, could you be my librarian? So she's basically doing this as, you know, something to give Diderot some much needed funds. And so she's helping the philosophes. She, you know, carried on correspondence with Voltaire and the philosophes loved her because she loved them. And so that's really Catherine the Great. Now, Joseph II, thank you so much, Kayla Rose. Oh, Kayla. And I just, uh, you know, you were just talking about Versailles on Twitter and here you are on Instagram. There we go. All right. So Kayla Rose, thank you so much uh, for that. And Katie333 on, Inst on Instagram. And so Joseph II, was the most ambitious but the least successful. And the thing is, is that sometimes like, you know, when we think about like goal setting, for example, you're supposed to have manageable goals. Like if you set a goal like way higher than you could possibly get, that doesn't really help you because you can't get there. And so Joseph II was like, oh yeah, you know, we need to abolish serfdom. We need to have like full toleration and we need to have this, that, and the other. We need to do these huge reforms. And it doesn't matter if I have buy-in from the nobility. And, you know, that didn't really work out out so well. So Joseph II's reforms uh, tended to fail. And actually, it was said that Joseph II requested that his epitaph um, be something to the effect of, here lies Joseph II, who failed at everything he did. And so as far as that goes, uh, you know, Joseph, even though he had big plans, big goals, big dreams, all of that stuff, uh, you know, it wasn't, uh, you know, he wasn't really successful in implementing these things that he wanted to, that he wanted to implement. So that's something that I think is, uh, is important to note there. Now, also Napoleon, you wouldn't think of him, you know, with uh, Frederick, Catherine and Joseph, but Napoleon had some some, you know, some aspects of enlightened absolutism, you know, where he was an absolutist, but at the same time, you know, he'd have plebiscites, he'd give people an opportunity to vote for him uh, and stuff like that. So Napoleon, you know, religious toleration that he proclaimed Catholicism, the majority religion, but that you can, you know, be whatever religion you want. All right. The tea is still uh, still uh, cooling a little bit. Do what you love. Now, one thing about study advice, you know, a lot of students are like, hey, what's going to be on the exam? You know, what do you think the DBQ is going to be? And I, I tell them, I don't know what the DBQ is going to be. I don't care. It's counterproductive. Speaking of do what you love, though, like when people are like, what do I need to study? Don't study something that like based on some prediction on the exam. What I tell people is when you're thinking about studying on your own, um, do study the things that you're interested in. 
it. Now, there are, you have to consider if you're interested in it and you know everything about it, then don't study that. That's not going to help you. Now, if you're not interested in something and you don't know, so if you're just like, oh, you know what? I think I'm going to delve into uh, 17th century social history. By the time you spend half an hour with that, you probably won't know much more than you did because you don't find it interesting. Now, if anybody finds 17th century social history interesting, then great. But, you know, you're like, hey, you know what? I thought, you know, my teacher was talking about the Enlightenment. You know, I thought that was kind of interesting, but, you know, I had some stuff going on and I didn't do all the readings. Maybe I should do go back and do that. So you're looking for something high interest and medium to low knowledge. Okay. So I think that that's important when you're studying now, make sure it's stuff that's actually going to be on the exam. You know, if you're like, Oh yeah, you know what? I want to research, you know, tank warfare during world war two or something like that. That's probably not going to be an area of emphasis, but assuming it's going to be something that's going to be on the exam, uh, study the things that you enjoy, do what you love. And uh, thank you, Mr. Cox's class for the mug here. All right. So then um, go over the important meetings such as the Congress of Vienna. Abby, feeling that dragon energy. Abby, I have a feeling that Kanye wants you to make a five. And so the thing is, you know, there are, you know, several meetings. Now, the Congress of Vienna, I've got a video on that. And I've also got a Metternich rap. Uh, so if you type in Metternich, it should be two of the things there. And, you know, there was a guy one time that he was in grad school. He was an American who was studying international relations as a graduate student in Vienna. And he said that my rap was the most valuable thing for him on a test that he had to take. So I, I was pretty honored by that. Um, but the Congress of Vienna is really about reasserting the conservative order, okay, after the French Revolution, which the French Revolution was largely about liberalism and nationalism. And so you think about Metternich in Austria, you know, the Austria, you know, Austria-Hungary, had no less than 10 different distinct ethnic groups there. And so when you consider that there were no less than 10 distinct ethnic groups, well, nationalism makes Austria-Hungary into a powder keg. And so Metternich, being from Austria, is looking to try to make sure that liberalism and nationalism are stopped in their tracks. And so the Congress of Vienna is out to do just that and to keep these things from becoming a thing. Now, of course, uh, you know, there are some uh, some failures of this concert of Europe, this conservative order, uh, Greek independence, you know, with its liberalism, its nationalism, and its, uh, you know, liberalism, nationalism, and even romanticism coming in here, you know, that certainly was something that, hmm. That was something that, you know, was something that's kind of a setback, be, step back because, you know, the conservatives couldn't really stop that from happening because there was so much sym sympathy from the Philhellenic societies and, you know, in, in the countries in Europe that were basically like at first the governments didn't want to support the Greeks and then they did. Um, but basically Metternich, for the better part of 1815 to 1848, uh, you know, did a pretty decent job of keeping Europe stable and uh, pretty much like war and revolution free. That conservative is about uh, in the 19th century is about stability within states and stability between states. Stability within states being that the aristocracy remains on top and everybody knows their place. We preserve as much of the failing old regime as we can. Stability between states, not only do European states not go to war with each other, but if there is an internal um, revolutionary attempt or something like that, then their buddies will come in to help them, which is what basically happened during the revolutions of 1848, which the revolutions of 1848 uh, are happening all over uh, Europe, you know, with the exception of Britain and Russia. And they're pretty much short lived. The conservatives uh, reassert themselves at the end of that because the revolutionaries are so divided. Revolutions of 1848, that's something else I've got a video on. And uh, Samir Patel, uh, what is the Munich Agreement? And what did it do? The Munich Agreement, you want to associate that with the policy of appeasement. Okay. The policy of appeasement and appeasement was basically this idea. Remember after world war one, we got 900 people here, ladies and gentlemen, let's see if we can hit the thousand. Tell your friends we're here. Uh, that appeasement was the idea that if you give Hitler Czechoslovakia, Okay, so Hitler by that time had already gone into the Rhineland. He had gone into um, he had gone into Austria. 
And now he says he wants the Sudetenland in Czechoslovakia. Now, Hitler was into pan-Germanism, this idea of uniting all of the German people under one government. And so when he goes into Austria, the Anschluss, okay, so you see now that all Germans are together and German-speaking peoples are united. Now, he says, I want, Czechoslov I want the Sudetenland, which was a part of Czechoslovakia that was not when these nations created after World War I that was predominantly German. And so Hitler said, look, I mean, the 14 points, self-determination of peoples, right? You know, we want Germans to be part of Germany. And Neville Chamberlain, uh, you know, the prime minister of uh, the UK, uh, of Britain, you know, he believed that, you know what, if we let Hitler go into the Sudetenland, Hitler promises he won't go into the rest of Czechoslovakia, which of course he does later. Um, and of course he won't go into Poland or anything like that. If we give him what he wants, then he'll stop. And that's the whole policy of appeasement. So the biggest thing about the Munich Agreement is this is the agreement that uh, that Britain and France make with Hitler, where they abandon their alliance with Czechoslovakia. And they say, Hitler, you can go in there, but please don't go into Poland. Please be a buddy and don't go into po Poland. All right. So we've got uh, we've got that now. Uh, my this is like the third time you're tweeting at me. OK, so let's see. Um, all right. Of art throughout different times, how it's changed is important. Hi from Roseville, California, Dragon Energy. So glad to see that. My now, as far as this goes with art, OK, the, the most the thing with, that you need to understand about art. Now, and I tell people this in all of my broadcasts um, is sometimes people are like how much art is going to be on the exam. Um, and I tell them it doesn't matter how much art is going to be ex on the exam, e even if there is if there's no art or if it's all art that all of the art movements are going to be applied to their time okay now i'm not necessarily on a uh, you know on a public broadcast going to spend like the rest of my time going over uh you know every single art movement in european history but uh at the same time if you've got a specific one you want me to relate let me know and let's look at the next thing here okay so we've got uh we've got something here all right uh let's see so it looks like uh miss Kunkelman has got some things uh going on here uh let me go ahead and uh retweet that thank you miss uh Kunkelman for uh you know she is at wait what okay so let's see can we retweet wait it says it's been is it been deleted or has it okay uh i think it i think it's there okay so excellent okay so y'all might want to uh educunk at e-d-u-c-u-n-k and uh she is uh actually doing a little bit of live tweeting from a uh from a teacher so uh this is really cool here all right thank you uh thank you so much yeah this is awesome like we need to chat sometime uh once exam season's over so let's uh let's get in touch that is such a cool looking giraffe all right so ladies and uh ladies and gentlemen all right so as far as uh as far as that goes um oh my goodness okay so uh so kayla rose is uh is self-taught wow okay so let's go ahead and look at the next question all right so uh charlotte feeling that dragon energy um, Pugachev's rebellion and who was involved. Okay, so that's going back to Catherine the Great. Okay, so you want to uh, you want to think in terms of Catherine the Great uh, and Pugachev's rebellion was a rebellion against her, and so she put this down very very fiercely. And what this does, the reason why Pugachev's rebellion is important, Charlotte, and is not necessarily in a survey level course to know everything about Pugachev's rebellion, but to understand the significance and. And the significance of Pugachev's rebellion is that it's demonstrating that Catherine the Great at the end of the day was committed more to absolutism than the Enlightenment. All right. And Hannah, now one thing about uh, art in the uh, Carpe Diem, hopefully a Carpe Friday, all right, feeling that dragon energy. Um, the art of the Enlightenment. Now, the Enlightenment, uh, you know, you're really kind of going between like, you know, Rococo and then into neoclassicism. Like it's kind of transitioning there. Now, one thing about Enlightenment art uh, that often, you know, becomes a thing is a lot of times the Enlightenment is about, uh, you know, is about people. 
Okay, so a lot of your enlightenment art is very human centric. And the best thing to do with enlightenment art, okay, that, uh, you know, which is really into like portraiture and people and, you know, statues and busts, you want to be able to compare that with romantic art where people take a back seat um, and natural scenes are much more important. That's where we kind of get into that enlightenment theme of man over nature and then the romantic theme of nature over man. So I would say that that's going to be one of the things that you could get into um, if you are in a position having to compare the Enlightenment with Romanticism, which is something that's come up on several uh, previous tests. So that's a comparison we see a lot. So I, I would definitely be ready to think about that in terms of contrasting that with Romanticism, but of course, very, very people centric. All right. And uh, Kristen. All right. So we've got uh, that drag feeling, that dragon energy. Um, and so Khrushchev's reforms, please and hi from New York. Shout out to Mr. Thacker's AP Euro class. All right. So Khrushchev, one of the things about, uh, about Khrushchev is that he begins with his, uh, you know, so-called secret speech or cult of personality speech. Uh, you know, Stalin was, you know, in a lot of ways, Stalin was not really like a, I mean, he was kind of, I mean, there's a little bit of like real politic here and there when you think about it, that during World War II, Stalin showed a willingness to uh, appeal to nationalism. He had a willingness to appeal to religion, like these priests that he persecuted before the war. He's like, hey, can you come on out and pray with the soldiers? and, uh, you know, have a liturgy and all of that kind of stuff, you know, do some processions because people want to see this, you know, it's like people want to see the priests. And so, you know, the thing is that Stalin, there were some things that departed from, you know, traditional socialist ideologies. Um, and one of those things being Stalin's cult of personality, that socialism, um, you know, in its pure form is not supposed to be about like the elevation of an individual. So Stalin became this cult of personality. Also, you know, during Stalin's time, you've got uh, the guru log, um, the Holodomor, uh, the starving to death of the, you know, of the Ukrainian peasants. Uh, kulaks is something that often uh, gets put into there. So, you know, basically, uh, you know, Khrushchev is trying, you know, he's coming in there and I'm not really like an expert on 20th, the 20th century Soviet Union. But uh, now the thing is, although that Khrushchev is, you know, and this is something I've seen on a multiple choice question before, uh, that Khrushchev is, you know, turning away from some of Stalin's more repressive tactics, okay? But at the same time, it's not, don't confuse this with liberalizing or anything like that. Um, and so Khrushchev is not liberalizing. He's not allowing free speech. He's not allowing criticism of the government. Uh, you know, that's going to come later with Gorbachev, with the glasnost and perestroika. Now, remember, glasnost and perestroika, the way I remember that, is glasnost is openness. I think Glasnost. Okay. So, you know, glass, I can see, I can see through it over there. Right. So I can see through it. And so Glasnost and Perestroika. Now, Perestroika is restructuring, which I think, you know, structure is in Perestroika. So Glasnost, openness and perestroika restructuring. Okay. So, so Khrushchev is, you know, and he's trying to modernize. I think I've seen something before about, you know, trying to, you know, get into more of a, you know, um, not necessarily a consumer economy, but getting into more of a consumer economy than what you would have under Stalin, whose five-year plans had focused exclusively on production without regard to, you know, what, uh, you know, what people actually wanted to buy. All right. And with that, uh, let's go ahead and uh, do a few uh, shout outs on Instagram. See how my memes doing here. Uh, Vmaster221. Thank you so much for the uh, for the follow. Emmanuel1020. And uh, let's see. Abby Yuhan. Thank you so much for the follow. Colin. Uh, thank you, uh, Eshan and Ash. Wow. 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 All right. And then M. Silverstein. Uh, now, contextualization and synthesis. Now, I don't tend to do a lot of writing questions uh, during this time, but uh, at the same time, since you're asking, you came over to Instagram, you used the dragon energy hashtag. Um, you know, you had that before, you know, dragon energy at the very beginning of your question. That's the best thing to do. Thank you all so much. Uh, and I like how, uh, you know, yikes, uh, Ken Kendrick, um, Conrad, you've got here the uh, 
you know, you've got dragon energy first. I like it when dragon energy is before the at, because that means all of your friends can see it, whether they follow me or not. So thank you so much. Um, as far as, uh, as far as that. All right. So as far as that goes, ladies and gentlemen, contextualization. Now contextualization is, you know, in the first paragraph of your DBQ or LEQ. Now, now the thesis needs to appear either in the first or the last paragraph. Um, contextualization can technically be anywhere, but your reader is typically expecting to find it at the beginning and it works out kind of well there because when you think about a Star Wars movie, we'll start off with that opening crawl, which gives you some valuable context. Now, one thing is contextualization is background, but a lot of times when people think background, they're thinking vague, okay? They're thinking very, you know, that you should be vague, but don't. Background with details. If you watch the very beginning of a Star Wars movie, you'll notice that it mentions specific people, places, events. It's not just, give, I mean, it's giving something that's actually useful. So what you're doing is you're looking at something kind of a, surrounding like immediately before or at the very beginning something that sets the foundation for what you're talking about that is contextualization okay so now contextualization either needs to be in the at the same time or immediately before that now synthesis now remember I don't, I mean, more advanced students can do synthesis. Synthesis is one of about five different ways to earn the complex understanding point. Um, but if you do synthesis wrong, okay, because synthesis, you're reaching out beyond and you're making some kind of useful like comparison and not just a comparison that you're going into like a historical like principle or something like that. So the thing is, there's one thing that, uh, you know, Yikes has just said, uh, um, the Justinian Code and the Napoleonic Code, um, and uh, shout out to Palazzo's class. So the Code of Justinian would be an example here of something that would be like a possible synthesis opportunity if somebody was thinking in terms of, you know, typically what happens is that law can be built up over time. Okay. This would be like our big, like historical principle that every once in a while, there is a leader that comes through and fundamentally reforms the laws to make sure that all of the laws are fresh. They are not contradictory. They are all they've been gone through. And you've put out this new set of laws that applies to everybody equally and it applies throughout the uh you know throughout the empire and so justinian with the code of justinian uh you know justinian who was a late roman maybe early byzantine emperor you know depending on how you look at it you know around the um the four the, the fifth or sixth century um you know ad and so in the late roman empire you know justinian uh, puts out this uh you know this body of civil law the corpus juris civilis which is the code of justinian now the napoleonic code okay the napoleonic code is napoleon doing something very similar to what justinian did because the french laws were all like regional they were old you had some contradict with that and napoleon decided that they were going to create a new system of laws for France, okay, that he was going to start from scratch and he was going to put out this uh, this new code of laws. And so that is the Napoleonic Code and it was based on Roman law. You could say that the Code of Justinian might have been kind of a, uh, you know, of a starting point um, for this. So as far as that's concerned, that would be possibly an example of synthesis so-called. Now, as far as that goes, ladies and gentlemen, some of y'all have joined us after the broadcast started. So let me remind you, um, I don't really get into, because I've got a video on writing already. I've got a video, on, a free video on the DBQ and the LEQ. Also, um, if you're at tomritchie.net slash euro, remember the Romulus Euro app um, is available at the App Store and on, on Android, Google Play, and it's 99 cents until this broadcast is over. Then it goes back to 2 dollars um, and then we've got the salon review where only 30 spots here. I've got 13 spots left. Now, this is a small group setting where everybody's going to get to ask a question and it's going to be kind of like me in a classroom setting whether, rather than having a thousand people here. Now, the, last night's multiple choice strategy session, there's a discount code there, but also the eight month writing clinic, you can get $10 off eight clinic 10. And that's where I'm like literally setting up 
all of the stuff, several hours of footage of me demonstrating writing. So you can click there and you can take a look at this writing clinic and enroll in the course. I'd recommend the archive because all the broadcasts are over. So you can get that for $17 with eight clinic 10. Okay. So that's something you can do there. So remember, but we've got that salon review coming up and up to 30 people will be in there in a small group setting. All right. So going back to Twitter. Okay. Um, let's see the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand Madison. Uh, of course that, you know, goes back to, like I said, the, the nationalist powder keg of Austria-Hungary, where uh, you had Serbia, which was technically an independent country, but there were still some Serbs um, in the Austrian Empire. And so when Archduke Franz Ferdinand is going to Sarajevo, there's this uh, there's this terrorist, you know, nationalist terrorist association uh, called the Black Hand. Stay hydrated, kids. Water's good for your brain. And so, you know, Archduke Franz Ferdinand goes to Sarajevo, which is, uh, you know, right there, you know, right there near Serbia. And this terrorist organization shoots him. Now, he was, you know, in a convertible. Like, I mean, he, he wasn't really taking a lot of precautions and the chain of events that sets World War One in motion. And I've got a video on the causes of World War One. You might want to look at that. OK, so let's go ahead and see what else we've got here. All right. Uh, the main points of the let's see, uh, let's see the main points of the Napoleonic era. Mr. Goldstein's class. So good. So good. All right. And so as far as that goes, uh, we've got the main points of the Napoleonic era. Now, of course, uh, Napoleon comes in following the directory, which was kind of a cooling off period in the French Revolution. Very important to know the phases of the French Revolution, okay, that you've got the, uh, you know, the liberal phase or the, mo you know, the moderate, you know, liberal phase at the very first, the Estates General and all of that. Then you've got the radical phase that's more influenced by Rousseau. And then after, you know, the reign of terror and all of that kind of stuff, then you've got the directory phase. All right. The directory phase, um, what you're seeing here is, uh, you know, kind of a cooling off period. It's not, there's not a lot distinctive, like you're not really going to be asked like serious, you know, a bunch of questions about the French directory. But in 1799, the directory uh, was pretty weak and Napoleon and some allies launched a coup d'etat. So Napoleon set himself up as first consul. There were initially three consuls that were governing France. So you've got, uh, you know, the consulate and then the empire. OK, so, you know, you've got on one hand the French consulate, which is Napoleon uh, ruling with these consuls. Now, he's still kind of, you know, in a position of primacy. But let's see. I believe it's 1804, okay, um, that you go from the consulate to the empire, okay? So Napoleon Bonaparte, yeah, so the French empire, the first French empire in 1804, Napoleon proclaims the empire. Now, first of all, Napoleon, like when people think like, you know, why did the French accept Napoleon? Wasn't the French Revolution about liberty and liberalism? But remember that for the French Revolution was also about nationalism and Napoleon was coming in and there had been all of these warring factions together and Napoleon brought stability to this French nation. And also there were some things that Napoleon did that were pretty liberal. So when you think about the Concordat, where Catholicism is the majority religion, but you can still be whatever religion you want. Uh, then you've got the Napoleonic Code, which we mentioned. We also want to note that Napoleon represented a step back for uh, you know, it represented a step back in terms of women's rights in France, that while you had earlier a liberal phase, a radical phase, uh, Napoleon was in a lot of ways, you know, he brings in a bit of, uh, you know, a bit of conservatism that, you know, you can't just allow women to get divorced, you know, if they want to. Um, during the reign of terror, um, the National Convention passed a law saying that a woman could get divorced under the same criteria as a man. And and the thing is, what does that do for the family and the institutions that Napoleon's trying to promote? And so Napoleon makes it very difficult, again, for a woman to get a divorce. She can get a divorce um, if it is a situation where she is, uh, you know, it's a situation where her 
um, yeah, her husband is like brought the mistress into the house and therefore publicly embarrassed her. Then that is something that that was the line that where a woman could sue for divorce. So as far as having equality and divorce, women did not receive that under Napoleon. So I think that, you know, make sure you understand that that is a step back for women's rights. OK. And Reese, uh, the fifth time you've tweeted that. Yeah. The thing is, I can't see, you know, necessarily, uh, you know, see every tweet here. I'll reload it. And then there are a bunch of them and that sort of thing. All right. So as far as that goes, Reese, uh, the seven years war, um, you know, I would say, you know, part of my job here is to uh, let you know when you're barking up the wrong tree. I, I would not consider the seven years war like one of the major wars of European history. Now watch that be like the DBQ or something like that. But um, you know, really that that's going to be more important for U.S. history and the history of like, you know, colonial America and that sort of thing um, that I would spend more time like looking at other wars like the Napoleonic Wars, uh, the uh, War of the Spanish Succession with Louis XIV. So really, I would just if you're confused by that, I would just go ahead and back away, uh, you know, which sometimes the Seven Years War is called, you know, the first like truly like world war because it's a war that is going on in the colonies as much as it's going on in Europe, maybe even more so in some ways. And, you know, then I see like Andrew here, another thing here. Can you go over how George the first of England became king and the effects of his policies, please? This is not a history of modern Britain. OK, this is a this is a, uh, you know, a survey course in European history. OK, so make sure that you've got that. All right. And Taryn. All right. Starting off with Dragon Energy. I love Love when y'all are starting off the tweets with hashtag dragon energy and you've got uh you know me after that so can i go over the council of trent shout out to mrs white's class okay now the council of trent which i've got a video on the counter reformation the council of trent we've almost got a thousand people ladies and gentlemen tell your friends we're here the Council of Trent is a church council that is, uh, you know, basically responding to the Protestant Reformation. Now, when we think about, uh, you know, when we think about the um, the Counter Reformation and all of that stuff, uh, you know, we need to think of, you know, two things. Okay, that it's not just against the Reformation, uh, which I tell you what, if anyone from uh, from Owensboro. I'm uh, Catholic uh, in Kentucky. So Owensboro Catholic, shout out to Miss Turner's class. Okay, if anybody is watching from Miss Turner's class, I uh, just want to make sure Miss Turner just got confirmed today and very, very happy for her, very excited. And, uh, you know, on her uh, confirmation pictures on Instagram, uh, you know, I was, I was flipping through this. She had a whole like 10 of them or whatever. And then I saw like in this little corner here, like, I'm looking here and well, you can't see it, I guess, but it's got like my video is on in the background. And so that was so awesome. I was like, oh, congratulations for getting confirmed. And then uh, there's my video. I wonder if they're watching something about the Counter Reformation at Owensboro Catholic. But yeah, shout out to Miss Turner and her students. I am so happy um, for her, um, you know, experiencing her confirmation today. So as we're talking about the Counter Reformation, let's dedicate this to Miss Turner, um, America. America's newest Catholic. And so far as that goes, ladies and gentlemen, that the Council of Trent, first of all, has to respond to the Reformation. And that is where we have the affirmation of Catholic doctrine, that the Council of Trent does not change any of the church's doctrines. Because remember that part of the Catholic Church's, uh, you know, whole thing is tradition, okay? That, you know, we do things as we have traditionally done them. We believe things as we've traditionally believed them. And that, you know, gives the Catholic Church a great deal of credibility for people who want stability and tradition. And so, which today, of course, uh, you know, you see a little bit of a conflict between, uh, you know, conservative and more progressive Catholics, uh, you know, which, of course, the Catholic Church, we want to note, uh, still has not condoned birth control, still does not ordain women as priests. This kind of stuff has come up um, before. And also, you know, which you can see with Pope Francis's comments, uh, you know, it, it's pretty much in line with Catholic philosophy that 
John Paul II as Pope uh, was very anti-communist, but the Catholic Church has never had an easy relationship with so-called capitalism or the profit motive or market economics and stuff like that. Uh, you know, of course, that's the thing. You know, after this, I'm going to be doing the Salon Review, and those are, you know, that is a paid review. And of course, the, you know, the Catholic, you know, Christian thing to do would be, why aren't you just broadcasting free all night? You know, Jesus uh, didn't ask for any money to die for your sins or whatever. Right. But the thing is, in, you know, that our market system is based on enlightenment morality, which says that, you know, selfishness is not necessarily a bad thing if there are mutually beneficial exchanges. And so, you know, that's where when you look at some of the conflict between, you know, Catholic Christianity and uh, the enlightenment, you see that there. So back to the Council of Trent. Now, remember, your AP exam is going to jump around too. Now, maybe I'm just jumping around because I can't focus, but still. So the Council of Trent, on one hand, the affirmation of Catholic doctrine that we are not changing a thing. All right. Now, then there is the reformation of church practice. OK, the reformation of church practice, which means that the Catholic Church isn't going to give up the things they believed, but they are willing to admit that, OK, Maybe we could educate our priests better, which today, you know, if somebody's a Catholic priest, you know that they've got a college degree, they've been to seminary, uh, you know, that they have been well trained and they are, you know, they're educated. So they're going to educate the priest. They they found seminaries. Um, they're going to tackle some of the corruption that's been a problem in the church. And also, even though they're going to say that the Pope has the authority to issue indulgences, they're going to stop the sale of indulgences. That is gone. That is a no-no. And so the Catholic Church, an affirmation of Catholic doctrine, you know, because Luther criticized the Catholic Church for its doctrines and its practices. So Luther criticized not only the sale of indulgences, but the ability of the Pope to issue indulgences, these forgiveness, these, uh, you know, forgiveness of sins and that sort of thing. And so you know, as far as that goes, the Catholic Church says we are not changing a bit of what we believe, but we are going to clean up the corruption, change the way we do things. And while we're thinking about it, we might want to also mention uh, the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits, which, uh, you know, dedicated itself an order, a new religious order dedicating itself to. Uh, you know, to fighting the Reformation. Now, of course, spiritual warfare, ladies and gentlemen, not uh, not physical warfare, but spiritual warfare um, in the service of the Catholic Church. And then there is the reform of spirituality. OK, the reform of spirituality, which uh, is best uh, typified by St. Teresa of Avila. And I've got a lecture on not only the Counter-Reformation, but also Baroque art. You know, when we're thinking about the Counter-Reformation, you know, art move really need to be put in the perspective of history. That's why I say if all of the questions are about art or none of the questions are about art, it doesn't matter because the art is ultimately associated with the history. And so you will want to get into the Baroque and how is the Baroque furthering the goals of the Counter-Reformation? So specifically when you look at Bernini's Ecstasy of St. Teresa, remember that the Protestants, they said that we're getting rid of religious orders and all of these convents and monasteries. And the Catholic Church, even to this day, still allows people to have a, you know, to dedicate themselves fully to the religious life. And so when you look at the ecstasy of St. Teresa, you know, it is showing this very intense and vibrant spirituality um, that can be had in the Catholic Church, okay? So that that is the thing that the Protestants, you know, Luther said, priesthood of all believers, you can have more spirituality here. Bernini, in sculpting the ecstasy of St. Teresa, shows that, you know, the Catholic Church can provide access to this very, very intense spirituality. And once again, congratulations to my friend, Mrs. Tur Ms. Turner. And, uh, you know, going into, uh, you know, hopefully I'll make an appearance at Owensboro Catholic at some point next year. We'll see. All right. And come on, Ica, J. Will from Ville, uh, v Viva Res or what? Vivian, 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 Vivian. Um, and then, oh my goodness, I saw an Instagram question here. The original Lauren, the original Lauren. Okay. Uh, Carol, 
Kata, Katamatori's class, okay, the Royal Society of Defenestration. Shout out to the Grant Park Dragon, CC's class, the Royal Society of Defenestration. Nice job there, Original Lauren. Hope you do well on your exam. And so, uh, Logan, I've actually, uh, you know, as far as, oh, great. This is so funny here. Could you talk about ways to answer multiple choice questions if you don't know them? Now, here's the thing, ladies and gentlemen, like it or not, this test is a test of whether or not you know European history. If you don't know the material, you're screwed. Now, People say, oh, this exam's not about trivia. Actually, trivia is at the bottom of like all knowledge. You know, that's why, you know, medieval and even Renaissance education, you know, focuses first on the trivium, uh, grammar, logic, rhetoric, that sort of thing. Trivial knowledge feel, makes the backbone for knowledge that comes later. And so that's why I like my Romulus app so much, which uh, if you're tomrich.net slash euro, it's a quick link there, or you can search for Romulus Euro at the App Store or Google Play. And this is going to, for 99 cents while this broadcast is still on, uh, then going back up to 299 uh, this is a nice way to just go over that little trivia not trivial knowledge so the thing is logan uh you know don't think about like how do i answer multiple choice questions if i don't know them because you're not going to be able to pass this exam if you don't know anything so why don't you study why don't you you know know something and all of that stuff uh you know time to uh, go on there and binge watch my playlist or whatever else uh you know you're going to do to make sure you're doing that and uh, then we've got here, uh, Keels. Thank you so much for the uh, for the follow there. Very uh, very happy to have you on board on my Instagram here. And Ethan Mancuso. Um, let's see, Ariana. Thank you so much, uh, Ariana Acosta. And uh, wow, so we got a lot of people coming in here. Thank you so much. Shout out to Mr. Horner's class. Nice job there. Okay. And so as far as that goes, remember that now I'm about to conclude this broadcast. I will be back tomorrow at 7 p.m. Eastern and Paul Sargent's going to join me. That's going to be probably a 90 minute to two, you know, to two hour broadcast. That's going to be a longer broadcast. Uh, so tomorrow at seven, join me. And then Friday at 9 a.m., the fifth annual breakfast with Richie. So, you know, get together with your class. Uh, you know, a lot of classes have breakfast and watch this broadcast. It's a wonderful tradition that I'm looking forward to. Uh, now, what I'm also looking forward to is getting together with a small group tonight. Okay. Getting together with a small group tonight and going deeper into some of the, the, the material and answering people's questions, you know, in a small group setting. We've still got nine spots available for the salon review. And if it ends up being a group of 21, I'm totally fine with that, but there are still nine spots available for tonight's salon review, and there will be another premium review session tomorrow night after the public broadcast. But let's make sure here that you know what I have to offer you. Now, I've got lots of free videos on YouTube that you're uh, welcome to watch, but I also have some things that might be helpful to you. The Romulus app is 99 cents. The salon review starts at 8.30. It'll be a two-hour small group review, and I think that's going to be great. Um, the multiple choice strategy session, a lot of y'all are struggling with multiple choice. Uh, you can get 30% off the archive of the session that ran last night. And then the writing clinic, if you want to get $10 off of my eight-month writing clinic to actually see me go in, you know, go Going deeper than the free videos, um, going in and actually, uh, you know, setting up these DBQs, analyzing documents and going very deep, several hours of footage. Eight Clinic 10 will get you $10 off where you get uh, the eight month writing clinic for only $17. And with that, let me go ahead and uh, take, a, take a couple more questions here, going back to Twitter here. Um, uh, Sneha is Russo considered part of the Enlightenment or Romanticism. Uh, now, the thing is that uh, Raskin's class, okay, uh, Raskin's class, uh, shout out there. Now, Rousseau is definitely considered part of the Enlightenment, a little bit of an outlier, okay? So, you know, you do see where Rousseau does have some romantic sympathies. Uh, you know, he's kind of, you know, glorifying, uh, you know, some things, you know, about, uh, you know, I mean, he talks about like the noble savage and, and some of these other things 
things that are that are more romantic kind of things. So he's got a foot in each camp. But certainly I would consider him an enlightenment philosopher in the sense that, you know, the social contract, it's not like he totally like distrust reason. I mean, it it's something that, you know, he puts a lot of logic into this. So, yes, I would definitely consider Rousseau part of the enlightenment and also remember Rousseau's influence on the French Revolution and specifically the radical phase of the French Revolution, the reign of terror, because Rousseau's social contract is not individualistic like Locke's, okay? Rousseau's social contract is, uh, you know, is basically about a, a radical democracy, making sure that the general will prevails. So if you're on the losing side of that, sorry, not sorry, okay? Whereas Locke, you enter the social contract as an individual to protect your life, liberty, and property, okay? So the thing is that Locke and Rousseau both had a social contract, but the foundation for that social contract, remember, for Locke is based on a more individualistic and liberal basis, where Rousseau kind of puts the social back in social contract, okay? So that's what you're dealing with with uh, with Locke versus Rousseau. Now, remember, Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau, all three of them wrote about the social contract. But remember, the social contract is different for every society that makes one. All right. So as far as that goes, let's see if we've got a couple of uh, shout outs here. Um, yeah, let's see. Uh, Julia, I wouldn't I wouldn't spend too much time going over some of that really recent stuff here. Um, but the Balkans, you can think of some of the same things that are starting World War One, you know, with the fall of communism. There were all these people in Yugoslavia that didn't particularly care for each other. But under communism, they got along because, you know, you kind of have to under communism. And so after the fall of communism, there were, you know, wars over there. Now, these are people with different uh, religious backgrounds. Uh, you know, these are people of different cultural backgrounds that basically been in this area. Because remember that this was dominated by the Byzantines. Then the Ottomans came in, the Austrians. You've got Catholics, Orthodox Christians, Muslims, uh, you know, which in Bosnia. I mean, you have you have white Muslims, you know, pe people that, you know, they just, you know, you've got the way that you stereotypically think about Muslims and Bosnian Muslims. Uh, they don't look any different than any other European, but they are Muslims. And so you've got, uh, you know, the Serbs and the Bosnians and a lot of other people over there that come from these different uh, cultural and religious backgrounds. And it makes like building a sizable nation very, uh, very difficult because of, you know, the kind of, you know, tribalism uh, that you've got left over there. All right. So as far as that uh, goes now, uh, Jocelyn, I do have some notes for a respect women video that I'm thinking about making tonight. OK, so I'm going to let's see Jared Tyler at Wando High School. OK, so we've got uh, we've got some um, some fellow South Carolinians. So uh, Jocelyn, look for that. I am going to get into uh, women uh, probably either tomorrow. I mean, I'll either put a video out that's on its own or I will get to that topic tomorrow evening or and or um, breakfast with Richie on Friday morning, because there are some topics I want to kind of hold off on. You know, the breakfast with Richie broadcast is like two and a half hours. So there's, uh, you know, going to be a lot of review there. It gets it ramps up a little each time. All right. So, uh, yes, thank you so much, uh, Miss Kunkelman. This is uh, this is so great. Um, you know, for that. And uh, yes, thank you so much for that. We've got the uh, the dragon energy is strong. Um, Jade, I will certainly I will certainly consider it in Miss Britt's class. Thank you so much, Mr. Panico's AP Euro class, um, you know, which, uh, you know, get y'all that. And then, wow, da, 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 da. all right, Mr. Fogel's class in California, Miss uh, Contrada's class. All right, let's see if we've got any more here. Uh, Let's see. Yes, uh, Julia, thank you so much for shouting out to that dragon energy. Uh, the War of the Spanish Succession. Remember that I've got a video on that. I've got a video series on Louis the Fourteenth Wars. OK, so uh, Miss uh, Laguerre's class. Thank you very much. Um, the New Monarchs. OK, Pepe, that is going around. You know, that's really kind of concurrent with the age of exploration. OK, so the age of I mean, one way I think of it is the the age of exploration brings in. Now in Spain particularly, you've got the Reconquista, uh, where Ferdinand and Isabella reconquer Spain. They unite the largest two Spanish kingdoms on the Iberian Peninsula. And then, uh, you know, a lot of this 
money that's coming in from the age of exploration is adding to the royal treasuries and all of that kind of stuff. Um, the peace of Augsburg, uh, whoever reigns his religion. All right. So ladies and gentlemen, thank y'all very much. And remember that there are still some spots left. And y'all can watch this as a group. It's not like every individual, like if you've got a group of your friends that wants to chip in uh, to be a part of this, uh, you know, be a part of this uh, bonus broadcast, this premium broadcast, uh, you know, that's something that you can do as well. It's like, this doesn't have to be you as an individual, but it's just the people that are in the same place watching the same computer. So let me just take a quick look there and see how many spots we have left over for that. We had nine spots left last time I checked. And now it looks like, let's see, it is loading. It's being a little slow on me. Broadcast does that. There are only five spots left. Okay. There are five spots for the premium salon review. So the next five people who purchase that are going to get in. It's going to be a group of up to 30 people. And I'm going to be talking about topics that have been submitted by the questionnaires. And so this is going to be much more targeted and everybody's going to get a chance to have their, uh, to have their questions answered and pr pretty much what's like a class classroom group. Um, so, uh, but thank you, those of you, we've got 800 of you left here, and I'm very, very happy about that. Remember, I've got plenty of video content on YouTube and also some things that, you know, you can purchase at tomrichie.net slash euro or not. Uh, I'm here to help anybody regardless of, uh, you know, whether they, you know, want to pay me anything or not. But remember, maybe consider watching the ads. I uh, give me my like two cents or something from watching that ad. Um, but ladies and gentlemen, do what you love. I love AP Euro. Y'all feel that dragon energy and let's pass this exam at noon on Friday. It's always a pleasure.